I appreciate everybody being here. Uh, welcome to the Ask Me Anything Real Estate Edition uh, for Together Credit Union. My name is Larry Jackson. I'm the Vice President of Real Estate here at Together Credit Union. I'm going to start over with uh, the first set of questions that uh, we have. So um, the first question that we had, or a lot of the questions that were presented to us as part of this process, were about the home buying process in general. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, what the steps are to go through the home buying process, starting with step one. Step one is to get pre-approved, choose a lender, uh, get yourself pre-approved, uh, start there. That's going to be where everybody wants you to be. Uh, typically, your realtors are not going to want to really get involved unless you've been pre-approved with somebody. That's typically the first question that they ask. So you want to start there. Uh, you'll start by applying for the loan. Uh, there's going to be some documentation that's going to be requested. Uh, your credit will be checked, things like that. And then you'll walk through the pre-approval. So once pre-approved, that's when you'll start talking to the realtors themselves and starting to look at properties. So once you've contacted a realtor, once you've uh, chosen somebody that you're comfortable with going and, and seeing homes with, uh, that's when you'll start the home process, the home viewing process. Now, that's changed a little bit since March. Uh, most everybody used to go to, you know, 10, 15 homes and uh, do all kinds of open houses and all that stuff. Uh, obviously, we're in a different world today. And so that has uh, allowed us to take a different approach. A lot of people are looking at homes virtually. So there are a lot of virtual tours online. A lot of homes that are on the market today are uh, offering virtual tours. You'll get um, more of a camera view of the home than you do uh, going in and, and seeing it in person. You're still able to go see homes in person. Your realtor will allow you to go see homes in person as well. Um, and really, honestly, you know, you're know you not going to be able to see cracks and walls through a camera. You're not going to get a great view of the, of the size of a room via camera in a lot of ways. So you might be more comfortable going to see it. Uh, but also uh, check out the virtual tours. Know what you're looking at. It may save you some time and energy of going into a house that you thought looked good from the outside. But uh, the pictures were better than, than the inside actually was. So uh, make sure you're looking at the virtual tours. The next step there is going to be once you've chosen a home, you're going to want to start the negotiation process. Now, one thing about the negotiation process in today's environment is if you're in a typical size home, uh, a value between, say, 150000 and 300000 uh, there is more. There are more buyers on the market than there are sellers. So therefore, there's probably four or five or six people looking at the same home you are and interested in putting a contract in on that home. Kind of starts a little bit of a bidding war of sorts where we're seeing a lot of contracts come in above asking price, um, which you know is indicative of back in the early 2000s. Uh, that's caused by the inventory shortage in the market. Another thing we're seeing is um, a lot of sellers do not want contingencies on their contracts, meaning if you have another home to sell or if you're contingent upon the um, you know, certain parts of financing, like you must have an FHA loan or things like that, they, they really want an easy contract. They really want to uh, take something that's easy to get in and out of and go as fast as they can. Uh, so keep that in mind. And your realtor will really be someone who should be a great resource for you uh, to help you through that process. Once you've negotiated and you've chosen the home and you haven't accepted contract, it's back to the lender. Now it's the lender's turn to show you what they can do and get you through from the negotiated contract to the closing. Uh, we're going to go through the appraisal process, uh, which typically happens after you do your inspection, your home inspections. Um, we're going to do the appraisal. We're going to order title work. We're going to do all that stuff. We're going to get you approved and get you ready for the closing. Once the loan is closed or once once we're to the closing, we walk through the closing and you are able to get your keys at that point and move in. So a lot of little things in that process. And I know we're going to share uh, our home buying process and the packet that we have put together uh, with everybody as well. So be on the lookout for that. But that's the general steps to the home buying process. Um, other things, uh, do we offer any special programs from the credit union perspective? The answer is yes. Uh, we have all kinds of different types of programs. Some things that we do, um, we do have a community contributor 
uh, program, which is what we call it, uh, that helps any kind of first responders, whether that's firemen, policemen, um, whether that's uh, nurses, doctors, uh, educators, uh, military, anybody working for the government, uh, things like that. We actually offer a program that allows for 3% down and what we call no PMI. And, and PMI is private mortgage insurance. I'll get a little bit into that as we talk about down payments as well. Uh, but that's one type of special program. Uh, for first-time home buyers, we also have another program that allows to go up to zero uh, percent down. So uh, we're allowed to go up to 100 percent loan to value, uh, which is uh, phenomenal, especially in this world today, uh, where some of the bigger banks have cut back and said they won't even do a loan unless you've got banking with them. So uh, in this in this environment, it's good to have some of these specialty programs, and there's other things that we offer as well. But those that's a look at a couple of different programs for us. Um, Another question came in about how much money, or how much earnest money uh, should you put down on an accepted contract? I'm really going to defer to the realtor to answer that question. Typically, it used to be if you had $500 on an earnest contract, uh, that seemed sufficient. Uh, today, remember, I'm, I, I talked about it earlier that there's more buyers uh, than there are sellers. And so what I've been seeing is a higher uh, earnest money on the contract. So I'm, I've been seeing typically in between two and $5,000 on typical sales contracts. Um, so work with your realtor on that. They'd be able to really give you a good guide and a gauge as to what they're seeing in the market and what they're seeing accepted in the market. Uh, but that has changed recently. And I, I think that again has to do with the number of people on the market. They're viewing it as if you're putting more money down, you're more serious. And so they're, they're accepting those, what they think are more serious contracts. Um, the other question, there's another question. Uh, if you have, if you like a home that is being sold as is, uh, but they accept the offer pending inspection, uh, can you get out of the contract and get your earnest money back um, if something serious is wrong uh, with the property? If you're, if you have an inspection negotiated in your contract and, and you are within your 10 days of the inspection and your negotiation time for the inspection, and you cannot come to an agreement with the seller, uh, then yes, you do have the capability of ending the contract. Uh, that is all legally in the contracts themselves. The realtor is the better person to really walk you through that and, and help you understand. Uh, but generally speaking, yes, if there's something within the contract or within the inspection, uh, you are able to uh, alleviate yourself from the contract. Uh, is it necessary to put 20% down? That's a great question. I just talked about earlier, we have some specialty products uh, that take you to 0% down if you're a first time home buyer. The standard down payment today is 5%. That, that means that your standard conventional loan, which is anything that is uh, eligible to be sold into the secondary market, uh, like Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac type loans, uh, those only require 5% down. Now, the, the reason why you hear 20% down all the time is because there's what's called PMI, private mortgage insurance on loans that are above 80% loan to value. So where you have less than 20% down payment. That private mortgage insurance is a premium that is tacked on to your, to your payment. And what that does is that protects the lender in case of default for higher loan to value loans. When you have 20% down, you do not. You are not required to have private mortgage insurance on you, on your loan, so that's why you hear a lot of people say you should put twenty percent down. If you have the capability of putting twenty percent down, great. Uh, most, especially most first time home buyers, but most buyers don't really come in with twenty percent down. Uh, most home buyers are going to have less than twenty percent uh, PMI especially from a credit union perspective, we, we weren't caught up in a lot of the things that happened back in 2008 during the uh, Great Recession. Uh, so we have uh, less lesser PMI premiums than your standard lenders. Uh, so we're able to actually offer a little bit less on the premium, uh, which is a benefit to our membership. Um, are there any down payment assistant options? Yes, there are. There's all kinds of down payment assistant options out there. Uh, there's different local government options where different municipalities will give you down payment assistance to move into their areas. 
A lot of them require certain income restrictions. Uh, so you need to look into those. Uh, but there are down payment assistance programs that are out there. Uh, they're local. There's a state uh, program as well uh, through MHTC, the Missouri Housing Development Corporation. Uh, so there are different down payment option, uh, down payment assistant program options for you. Uh, there's also certain builders have uh, certain uh, down payment assistance as well that they that they use through the unions. Uh, so there are different things. Uh, what are closing costs is another question that comes up, and that's that's a frequent question. And uh, really, you need to think about closing costs in a couple of different ways. So there's a closing cost that is a cost that the lender themselves applies to the loan. Um, that means that the lender keeps that money. Our closing cost in general is $750 from a lender's perspective. Um, so we, we charge $375 for an underwriting fee and $300 for a processing fee. On top of that, there are third-party costs. There are also closing costs. And those third-party costs are things like appraisals, title work. Uh, those costs are generally dependent upon how much your loan is. So the amount of your purchase price, your loan amount, um, those things can determine what that cost would be from a title company perspective. Now, there are also things that are called escrow cost or uh, what we call in the, in the business reserves, our, our, our reserve costs. So what the escrow is, is your taxes and insurance uh, that we must pay at the end of the year. When you get a mortgage loan, you typically are going to get it with the taxes and insurance payment in there. It's what we call pr principal interest taxes and insurance as a total payment. That, depending upon when you close, there are certain months that we have to collect up front. Now, your seller will also then refund some of that back, but there's a difference in there, and that is part of closing cost as well. So the typical average closing cost is going to run um, without the escrow side because that, that is very dependent upon what type of home or where your home is uh, and how much the escrow and your insurances are. The typical closing cost from a lender perspective and third party perspective is probably going to be about 2% of your loan amount, maybe 2.5%. So on a $100,000 loan amount, you're looking at about two thousand to twenty-five hundred dollars, give or take. Um, the best thing for you to be able to do, uh, to be able to determine whether or not you're getting the best deal for you from a closing cost perspective, is compare your interest rate to your APR. Uh, your APR is different, so your average, your annual percentage rate is different than your actual interest rate. The interest rate is literally what it sounds like. It's your loan amount times the amount of interest that we're going to charge for a year. So on a $100,000 loan at 3.5% interest, that's going to be $3,500 for the year. Your APR looks at your loan amount minus any fees as an equivalent to that same interest. And so what that means is the closer your APR is to your interest rate, the better you're getting a deal for closing cost. So take that into consideration when you're when you're thinking about closing cost. It's not always about the the amount of the closing cost itself or the the exact dollar amount, but what it means as an average to your to your interest. So those are those are some really good questions about down payment, uh, some different things about uh, interest rates and, and uh, certain costs there. Another question came in about uh, pre-approvals. Uh, if you get a pre-approval and you don't find a house right away, the exact question says 30 days. Um, your pre-approvals are good for 120 days from the day that you actually apply and we pull credit. So if we pull your credit today, we have 120 days before we have to re-pull your credit again. So as long as you find a home and close on that home within that 120 days, we do not have to report credit, which means your pre-approval letter is good up until then. If we are, you know, three months into the process and you're just starting to find a home, uh, we may have to report credit. We may have to reissue your pre-approval letter at that time, but it's, it's going to be dependent upon the timing of the contract and whether or not you're within your 120 days. Um, 
And also the backup question of that or the follow-up question of that was, do you have to wait a certain uh, period of, of time before you can redo your, your pre-approval? The answer is no, you do not. Um, if you find a home at 122 days, we can redo your pre-approval letter every 120 days, or we can redo your credit every 120 days. So if you're coming up on that 120 day mark and you're still looking and you're getting closer and you wanna redo your pre-approval, you're more than welcome to do so. Uh, we just reissue the pre-approval letter at that point, and then it's good for another 120 days. A um, couple questions about credit scores and credit here. Uh, what is credit? What is the credit worthiness to buy a home, and how do I get there? Uh, I'm, I'm assuming what you're asking is, what is the credit score? What's the minimum credit score to buy a home? So the minimum credit score for most products today is a 620. Now I'm going to give a warning here about what 620 actually means and, and where you're looking. Most of us do something on a regular basis to check our credit on a cons through a consumer product like uh, Credit Karma or something like that. Credit Karma does give a credit score if you pay for that product. However, that is a consumer credit score. And what that means is it's not the same credit score as someone who is pulling your credit for a mortgage uh, would see. Unfortunately, there's probably a thousand different algorithms to determine a different credit score. And there's a lot of different ways that people uh, utilize credit uh, or utilize those algorithms to pull credit scores uh, for purchases. For, for us and for all mortgage lenders, we do what's called credit averaging, which means that we're going to pull all three of the major credit bureaus. We're going to pull Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. We're going to take the middle score um, as an average credit score. If you are applying jointly, we're going to take the lowest of the two middle scores. So if you and your significant other or the person that you are applying with um, each have a credit score and yours is a 700 and theirs is a 695, we're going to go with the 695, which is the lower of the two scores. So that's the general answer for what's the minimum credit. It is 620. Now, how do I get there and how do I do things? That really is dependent upon um, you know, your credit situation. What I can tell you is most of your credit score is going to be based upon two different items. Uh, the amount of credit that you have uh, available to you and how you pay your credit. That's That accounts for about 65% of your credit score. The packet that we have to be able to give out to everybody that we'll be sending to everybody who signed up for the Facebook Live event has a really good uh, piece of information in there that talks about all the major uh, points to the FICO score and how it's developed um, and how you can get there. If you have direct questions about your specific credit score or your specific credit, we're happy to talk to you about that. Um, but how you get there is really dependent upon you and your credit situation. Uh, so it's a very difficult answer to answer in a broad based environment, uh, but really uh, making sure that you pay your credit on time. Uh, that you don't have a lot of 30-day lates or anything like that, and hopefully they're not new because that will really hurt um, as well, and ensuring that you have available credit. So if you have a $5,000 credit card, you don't want to have more than $2,500 on that credit card. Uh, you want to make sure that you only have about 50% or less of your credit availability uh, outstanding. Um, there was a question about uh, are there first-time uh, Home buyer programs for uh, people with credit scores between 589 and 614. Um, I will say this, that FHA programs for some lenders will go down to 580. Uh, FHA is the Federal Housing Administration. Uh, they are geared towards, um, uh, you know, typically their, their mission is to help lower income uh, individuals uh, get into housing. Uh, their, their mission is to help uh, those who are in need uh, get into housing and, and create home ownership. That being said, they, they don't only help those who are, are uh, less fortunate from an income standpoint. They will help others as well. And if your credit score is below that 620 mark, there are some lenders that will allow you to go down to 580. Most lenders today 
are at that 620 mark. And that's, you know, uh, that's really due to where we are in the market and uh, the pandemic and, and different factors that are going on in, in the world today. So uh, you can find lenders that are below the 620. Um, you know, caution yourself on whether or not you really need to be or looking at uh, buying a home if you need to uh, do something with your credit that can help you get to the 620. Uh, that would be preferable for you. I will also tell you um, it'll be less expensive for you if you can get to that 620 mark. Um, you know, when you're going down lower on credit, there is a cost to that uh, and the lenders will, you know, bake in or, or uh, set different cost and different rates uh, for the lower credit tiers. So be careful on that if you're going to, uh, you know, try to find credit below that 620 mark. More questions about the first time homebuyer programs. Uh, as to, do FHA loans cover uh, multifamily housing? Um, I do believe actually FHA does cover multifamily housing. Uh, I believe they will do uh, two unit properties. Uh, I'd have to look up the guidelines specifically to know uh, what the general uh, caveats there are, uh, but I do believe that they do allow for uh, two unit properties. Um, then another question on first time home buyer, first time home buyer programs, uh, really what is a first time home buyer loan and, and how would you qualify? Uh, it's an interesting point because really first time home buyer is kind of a misnomer right now. Um, you can actually have owned a home previously and be considered a first time home buyer if you have not owned a home in the last three years. So the a first time home buyer is considered anyone who is buying their first home or anybody who is buying a home that has not owned one in the last three years. Now, the fun part about that is if you are applying jointly with someone else, um, if one of you is not a first time home buyer and the other one is considered a first time home buyer, you have not owned a home in the last three years, you actually still can qualify for first time home buyer programs. The, the, most of the guidelines call for just one applicant uh, to, to be a first time home buyer. We have two or three different programs that fit that same uh, mold in the first time home buyer. So great question about uh, the first time home buyer information. Uh, coming down to the last initial questions that were sent via email, I don't know if we've gotten anything online. If you do have any additional questions, feel free to send them in. Uh, we do have somebody here checking our chat and we'll be able to uh, answer any additional questions. But coming down to uh, just the last couple of things here, um, what are some do's and don'ts of buying a house? I'm gonna take that from the credit perspective or the lending perspective versus the um, home perspective or, or going in from a realtor perspective. From a lender's perspective, a couple of things that you do not wanna do uh, while you're in the process of buying a house is don't go buy anything else. Um, the number one thing that you need to know is every lender is required 10 days before your closing to repool your credit. What that means is if we issue a pre-approval letter to you because you qualified at the time that we pulled your credit, but you went out and ran up your credit cards or bought a whole bunch of new furniture before you got into the house or got that new car you always wanted, um, you could end up knocking yourself out of an approval. Uh, we are required to check credit. The other thing that can come up is if you have gone delinquent on your credit, um, we will be checking everything within that 10 day mark. So that that's a definite, please do not do that. Do not do anything that negatively affects your credit or takes on new credit. A um, couple other things really uh, from a due perspective is if you have the capability of paying down a little bit of extra uh, money on your on your debt, do that before you apply. Um, you want to you want to make sure that you have some extra money. Don't one thing that you don't want to do is use every bit of your debt savings for down payment. Uh, don't forget that when you go into a new home, there may not be window dressings or things like that. 
uh, I can tell you my my very first uh, new house, the first house I ever bought, I moved in and the first thing I noticed is that my neighbors could see inside every room of my house because there were no blinds. And so I ended up going out and spending a bunch of money on blinds. Uh, wasn't something I prepared for, wasn't something I thought about. But there's things like that to think about. Um, you know, if you're living in an apartment today, you don't mow your yard. If you move into a house tomorrow, you will have to mow your yard. So you're going to have to buy a new lawnmower. What you don't want to do is put yourself in serious debt or uh, have spent all your money and not be able to afford to do the things that you need to do once you move into the house. So make sure you have some cushion on that down payment uh, and understand that there are things that you haven't thought about yet uh, that you're going to want to do uh, when you when you move in. A lot of a lot of folks don't have tools and things like that that they're going to need as a homeowner. Um, if you've been renting for a long period of time, uh, there's a lot of things you may not have needed to do uh, as a renter that you're going to need to do as a homeowner. Um, so make sure you're prepared for that. That would be my my big do is is make sure you're prepared and have a have a nest egg and a cushion uh, for those surprises that you didn't think about. And definitely do not do anything to harm your credit or go out to get new credit either. So those are the do's and don'ts that I would uh, talk about. Um, looking through, I believe we have pretty much hit on all the initially submitted questions. So um, at this time, if there's nothing else that uh, is being submitted, uh, we really appreciate everybody taking a, a look at our uh Ask me anything today, and we appreciate you being a part of our Together Credit Union uh, survey series and really uh, hope that uh, this was helpful for you. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, we're always ready to help. Again, my name is Larry Jackson, I'm the Vice President of Together Credit Union, and we appreciate you being here. Have a good night.